a very warm welcome to the fifth panel of today. We still have empty seats. For those of you who listen to me and are outside of the room, it's not as crowded and packed as in panel four. Please join us if you would like. And for those of you listening online, thank you very much for joining. It's about a very interesting topic. It's about parrots. It's about power. But before I talk about that, I wanted to say that it was pointed out to me that you still see the dialogue boards so you see the boards, which means there's not enough paper with comments on the boards, so we can do something about that. And if you have your program booklet and the last page is still in your booklet, it means that you have not left a comment on the board, which means you could do that. We have questions on the same sheet of paper. And then later, when we go downstairs together, please pin this on the dialogue board. To not, now we would like to talk about open AI and the socio-ecological transformation. So artificial intelligence truly changes labor world and work processes and in some cases also changes the private lives of people because many people are not even aware of where they are confronted with artificial intelligence. All of a sudden, chat GPT popped up and as an open AI generator, all of a sudden it could compose good, in quotation mark, text, a readable text, and you didn't really notice, you couldn't say whether this was written by a human or whether this was put together by a computer. So questions regarding copyright, etc. I also have to admit this was not the first thing that popped up in my mind. I thought, oh cool, there's something new, why not try this? And these large language models are something we could not imagine different industries to work without nowadays. The technology is there, it is used, whether it's very openly used and whether someone says, well, I wrote this text about my company uh, using ChatGPT or ChatGPT wrote it for me. We don't know, but it is used nonetheless. So just saying AI is the devil, it's terrible, that doesn't do the trick. But we have to see to it that human work is not degraded, that power structures are not abused of, and that AI can be used as a tool. But the question is, is this something that is even possible? Can we use AI in a way that we use the full potential, but at the same time that AI doesn't replace human work? Very interesting topic. I look forward to discuss this. First of all, I would like to welcome my guests. Mm, oh, I went into the wrong corner just because I was used to this. And now I'm allowed to stand in Yulia's position. We have Michael Zeman. He's a cultural scientist, author, journalist, and since 2005, active online. So one of the early birds, 2005, people weren't blogging or doing podcasts that often. That often. Since 2016, expert on the topic of platform regulation for the German Parliament, Bundesrat, Klima Forschungskollege, he was a member of the supervisory board, he founded the Otherwise Network, and also teaches at universities in Cologne, the University of the Arts in Berlin, and a paper Artificial Intelligence, ChatGPT, and the Labor World of the Future is also something you authored. Long title. Warm welcome to Michael Zeman. Hello to you. And we would like to continue with Matthias Honshu. Matthias, if you would like, please come and join us. He is a composer, a publicist, and a teacher at universities and has different roles in promoting the rights of the creative minds. In May 2018, he was elected into the supervisory board of GEMA and then became a member of the initiative Copyrights Urheberrechte. A warm welcome, Matthias Honschel. Before we enter an analysis of the status quo, so what can ChatGPT and the others all do? I would like to ask a personal question. Michael, Matthias, so author, journalist, composer, I'm a moderator. Our jobs all are subsumed under creative jobs. My basic idea always was, well, I think the creative jobs will last until the very end 
last job standing, if you will, even though artificial intelligence may have taken over everything else. But now the perspective is a bit different. How do you feel about artificial intelligence? Do you think that artificial intelligence is a threat to your jobs? Maybe you would like to start. Well, currently, I wouldn't say that it's the case. Of course, I had my paper generated by ChatGPT. No, that's a joke. But actually, I do not think that ChatGPT could already replace me at this point in time. I do notice how it helps me in my work. So I do use ChatGPT for certain tasks, but not primarily to generate text, but to bounce ideas back and forth and develop structures. So it's more of a thinking tool and not a writing tool for me. And that is why currently... I see that it's more of a merging of a human of human work and the machine work and that this is the modus operandi. For many standard texts, if I would work on writing standard texts and there is a huge market for this, then I think I would feel more threatened. But my specialty is not really writing in itself, but thinking and developing ideas and opinions, things like that. And Matthias, what about you? Well, of course, this is a question that I'm asked quite often. To be honest, I'm not scared. Personally, I'm not scared. Thinking of my future as a composer, as a publicist, on the contrary, I'm busier than ever before in the political an artistic field. But as you said, in my political role, I try to think in mandates and in system context. And if I take a look at that, I am concerned. I would like to first focus on music because that's probably the closest to my heart. So the mass music, the mass market will very quickly be lost. This is labeled lo-fi, and it's all rather generic music. So it's not really replaceable or interchangeable, but there's a huge similarity between the already existing tracks in this field. So we're not starting from scratch. We are already part of a development that made way, paved the way for stereotyping in this field. So for those who are active in this area, it will become a bit difficult. And this is concerning because it means that the liquidity in this field is uh, jeopardized. That means that creativity in this field is jeopardized. And I know that very quickly then, we have seen this in the past, is that it has to do with sustainability and Diversity. I just gave this by way of example, right? I think you can really transfer this to tags or um, to images. Okay, well, maybe just to get everyone on board. So what is currently possible? If we talk about AI, for example, if you pull out your iPhone or whatever phone, you take a photo and you edit the photos and it changes the colors and all of this is AI. So we have AI in so many fields of our life already. If we talk about Neuroflash, Jasper, ChatGPT, etc., actually I had to research this because I didn't know what Neuroflash was. So I don't know what it is. I didn't research it. Okay, well, I feel a bit better now. I could also have mentioned two or three other names. There's just so much happening in this field. No one can keep track when it comes to these large language models. So what is possible? You talked about generating text. You said you use this as a thinking tool. So what is it able to offer to you by now? Well, this is a very vast field. I could give you an infinite list, and I'll try to focus on OpenAI and their tools. The big hype right now is ChatGPT. You can also use this free of charge. And this is language model 3.5 that this is based on. You can use this free of charge if you want a better, higher performance model. You have to pay $20, and then you can use ChatGPT4. And ChatGPT4 is clearly, clearly, clearly more capable than version 3. It's absolutely amazing and astonishing. Because you actually can lead a philosophical discussion with this AI and will not be disappointed. So in other words, 
there would be very tangible cognitive output that normally you would expect from humans, but then there are lots of extensions. So these models can also interact with programs via interfaces and develop codes and plugins. A rollout right now is of image detection, so you can upload an image and then it can tell you what is on the image, or you you know, you upload an image of your fridge and then it gives you recipes as to what you could do with the content. Soon you will be able to talk to them because of a voice recognition. So this is a field in which things develop very quickly. It's also about lots of competitors, which are for other possibilities, like Anthropics Claude. And this can write a text of roughly or process text of a hundred thousand words. So this is a little a short novel actually that you can have a summary of. So there's a lot going on right now. But it's really at the big be beginning, right? But lots will happen because this is a very quick development. Yeah, this is my forecast. Because if you take a look at how these things work I described this in a lot of detail in the study, you see that it's a brute force. So with pure brute force, there's a lot of data that they use with lots of parameters without really knowing what will happen and what's going on. So in other words, probably there is a lot of room for optimizing this for improving it. So there are huge, vast potentials so you said they work with data a lot, and data would be the foundation, collecting data. The more data there would be, the better AI works, the better the algorithms work. So what kind of knowledge, let me call this knowledge, would chat GPT resort to using? I think there's a cutoff in 20 or 21, 2021, I think it was a cutoff. I don't know what the version you have to pay for? Is it the same? Yes, more or less. It also ends at 2021. 20, so they, these are called training data. If we take a look at the training data from the perspective of the copyright, then from our perspective, it is also a bit dubious, if you will, to see the data that they work with. So if we take a look at this from the perspective of the copyright, well, if I'm allowed to, I would like to also focus on that. But not only this, we always act as if copyright would be uh, something that's only for the cultural elite. But actually, it is the same as the right of informational self-determination. The first session that I attended was resisting algorithms. And the question was what to do if companies use our personal data against our wish in a way that could even harm us. And everyone agreed that this is something you shouldn't allow for. The German copyright legislation has been constructed in a way that it requires a natural person, a human. So AI-generated works cannot uh, fall under the copyright legislation because the law protects the natural person, the human. This is what it reads in Le the leg in the leg legislation. But if you think about that, it's almost the same, so that the assumption is there that if I do something uh, regarding the work of art, then it could also harm me as a human. Then, of course, we have to have two separate discussions. It cannot work. We are uh, basing this on the assumption that human dignity cannot be infringed on. So after a couple of months of very intense work in this field, I talked to lots of AI experts, professors, etc. And the status quo is that we have to assume that at latest 2010, everything that in some way was accessible was fed into the training corpora. We can assume that everything that was available in some way already has been learned, has been used as training data sets. And this includes all works that are digitally available, everything freely accessible, all kind of personal data which would be accessible. And this makes it clear to some people that if I claim 
the rights of my colleagues, then I'm talking about a very generalized social problem. So how is this done currently? Because I think this is like fighting windmills. How are you going to cope with this? This is such a large amount of data. What exactly do you mean with coping or coping with what? Well, trying to protect one's own rights. Do you mean how we can defend ourselves? Yes, that's the question. We don't really know if we can defend ourselves, but I don't really know whether we should speak about legal matters and uh, find out whether there is case law or not and the discussions about this. But the question is, why should we defend ourselves and how can we defend ourselves? What is this all about? I actually believe that defending ourselves should be not defending against technology. It's just there. And the technology did not go away simply because a musician, for example, did not like it. But in the debates about this, there is something else that is more important, namely that the claim that our services would not be needed in the future, that machines will do this. But currently, we have a situation that never existed in world history because everything that is digitally available was scraped and used for training purposes. There is a 100% demand, no matter whether this is attractive or sought after repertoire, but simply because it is there, it's already been scraped and used. And in the current situation, the Americans and the British and all Europeans believe that we are confronted with a situation where uh, consent, credit, and compensation were not given. We were not asked. We did not give our consent. We have no credits, and there's no transparency about what was used in what way, and there is no remuneration. So this is something that we really need to bear in mind. Talking about the systems, and here we need to differentiate, I'm speaking about generative AI. So I am not speaking about my satnav, for example, but I am speaking about situations or systems that can generate content. And and this is a potential, this is a promise of substitution. So the systems were created, they were maintained, they were developed with our contents without us participating in the value creation. And now they are going to be used to replace part of us. And I think this is economically very, very difficult and concerning. Yes, it's the plot for a Hollywood movie where a villain has really come up with a very bold plan. And I think I have more or less the same opinion about this, but I am a bit skeptical when it comes to copyright as the solution. We had the discussion for 30 years already. Copyright law was expanded. It was tightened. And um, the, the authors themselves are still in a poor situation. And the music industry is a very good example of this. While the major labels were really kind of now generating more cash. And um, I wonder whether it is really worthwhile to still try and flog this dead horse, or if it's really just only the music industry bosses that are becoming richer through this. And I would rather say what I could imagine, and I'm saying it from the start, I have no solution. I'm not the superhero that uh, is fighting the supervillain, even though this would be really great. Nobody has this solution, I think. So if I consider all the solutions out there, I reach the point where I think that we need to find collective solutions. For example, like the strike of the writers in Hollywood, because AI was something that uh, was uh, part of their strike, and they have already reached an agreement. This is what I read. So collective action, also state regulation might be interesting. I am thinking of exploitation companies or usage companies, open AI. Why don't they have to pay so and so many billions per year to uh, those associations that are defending our copyrights? So I think that this would really be uh, more appropriate when it comes to compensating those people who actually produce that content.
So whenever this is about copyright, it's just like trying to put some extra money in the backpack of a child that's already being bullied. And then the bully is just going to cash in on this extra money as well. Well, I think this is really going beyond our realm here today when we discuss whether this is the right instrument or not. But, you know, looking at copyright, you have a, a point there because what is being produced by regenerative um, or generative AI, the output, can no longer be actually tracked by our copyright law. We might need something new. It might be part of a new copyright legislation, but we will need to handle this somehow. And I think this is kind of something that is underlying as well. There is this kind of major societal concern about these new systems. We have a certain degree of euphoria and, uh, you know, since November of last year, there were so many things that happened. And why are these things happening right now? We are a part of this. Whoever's curious, whoever wants to try out something is all of a sudden somebody who's also producing training data. And uh, through our new generation, of data, we are in a constant loop, which then leads uh, to uh, an infinite amount of resources and uh, data that are generated. So we, on the one hand, need to look at ourselves as artists, as publicists. We need kind of a code of conduct. We need guidelines. Responsible action is what we need. And uh, this is what machines cannot do. They cannot assume responsibility. And also, we need to think what this means when those machines write texts but know no truth. It sounds a bit pompous maybe when I say it, but this is the current status quo. They have no relationship to truth. And hallucination might be something which describes this best. And for example, we represent photographers and all of a sudden, we have photos that can no longer be documents and nobody is liable for them, but everybody who is an author would be liable for them. And all of a sudden, this is gone. And this is why media literacy is so important and is becoming more important every day. And you kind of did not address one aspect. No, 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 sorry. This is not what I wanted to do intentionally. Okay, but uh, can an AI actually be an author? That is the question. So if, uh, you know, different elements are put together and this is amounting to a new text, well, if you are wording the question exactly like this, the answer is no. The AI cannot be an author. But as Michael was just describing, he uses AI as a punching ball, as an inspirational tool. And part of what the AI generated will then be part of what Michael is doing and authoring. So um, part of the product of AI might also be protected by copyright laws, but only because there is a person, a human being, assuming responsibility for this. As you rightly said, at the end of the day, author is a legal concept and copyright law comes from the um, personality law and without a person, there cannot be an author. But the question is, if we speak about the Hollywood strike of the um, screenwriters, and I think uh, uh, they had the following fear. The studio bosses could do the following with ChatGPT. They could say, OK, give me a story where I can have a specific actor, and then uh, you will just have AI produce a script, maybe a script which is really simple, but then they would go to the authors and say, make this a working script. And then what they achieve is that the authors no longer have the copyright law. They no longer have the copyright. Uh, normally, it would be the author that owns the script. And all of a sudden, this is no longer possible. So this is a tool to really knock out the copyright. You are only paid for your one-off kind of work or effort, and that is all. So I think that these are the tricks that are so important, and you really need to pay attention to those aspects. This is not about replacing authors is simply about uh, negating uh, 
authors or a authorship or a kind of creating structures where you can circumvent copyright laws. And I think that imagination knows no bounds in this context. Okay, let me speak about your research because when I read the introduction to your study, uh, you quoted iRobot. And this was in 2004. I saw it in the movies and I was thinking, oh, wow, this is sci-fi. But 19 years later, this is not so far away. And I thought back then this would be so far away at these parts of what the movie showed. And if not everybody knows the movie, have a look at it. It's really good. And this is about a robot, Sonny, who is accused of a murder. And then we have a dialogue between the investigator and the robot. And the investigator asks the robot if he could compose a symphony or if it could turn an empty canvas into a masterpiece or an artwork. And the robot answers, well, can you do this? And then the investigator is kind of uh, a bit confused and starts to think about this. And I found this was a really good introduction because it puts you right into the spirit. And 19 years after that, you know, with the painting, I am a bit skeptical, but yes, we have the tools out there. And when it comes to the symphony, we are so close to this. So how can we try and uh, make this technology serve humankind and serve our environment, humans and the environment both together. How can we manage this so that we don't have this power concentration anymore and uh, try to counteract this? This is what I meant with the example of iRobot. For a long time, we thought once the machines are coming and the AI is coming, they will just uh, do all the jobs that we don't want to do. The simple jobs, and we then have time to, you know, paint paintings, compose music, and exactly the opposite is happening. We still do the dirty jobs or the jobs we don't like, and the robots are starting to paint those pictures and uh, uh, to compose symphonies. And this was not the future I had hoped for. And also, the sci fi authors were thinking of something different. And that is so astonishing. All our sci fi concepts and our uh, concepts concepts of automation are kind of inverted. I don't want to go back into cultural history and AI, but in the past, it was always very schematic. And when there was something missing, you know, for those machines, it was creativeness. But, you know, mostly things turn out really, really differently. So what was your question? Uh, in how far you can put this at the service of humanity and the environment? That was my question. And if this is possible, we will see. I think yes. There are quite a few of individual success stories out there where all of a sudden through uh, re through generative uh, AI tools, they might experience a major leap in their own skills. For example, somebody has a good idea for a startup, a tech startup maybe, but they cannot code. And in the past, they would have tried to find somebody who can code. And these days, you would just use a chat GPT and produce the code for yourself. You know, it will be enough for a prototype. And then at a later stage, when they are more successful with their prototype and they have more capital, they can invest to have a decent coding. But uh, of course, these will be isolated cases, individual people that are empowered through those tools to do things they could not do before. But the question is, what is the collective effect? And I see little possibility um, for this to have a positive end. In all companies, I am seeing employees these days that are using ChatGPT mostly secretly. And within the workforce, they might have kind of a competitive edge or productivity edge, and they work with this. And then you might say, well, that's a great thing. You know, they have a career because of their use of ChatGPT. But that's nonsense, because at the end of the day, other people will do the same thing. And then expectations will change, the competitive pressure will increase, and people who 
do not use uh, AI will be left behind. And at the end of the day, the entire workforce will have lost. And who has earned the money? The capitalist. At the end of the day, all of these productivity gains are then earned by the bank or the capital. And this is why we must find collective ways you know, to be honest, the problem is, what is a value? What is the value of work, of any type of work? Every work has so many facets that a computer cannot reflect when it comes to personal relations, when it comes uh, to um, empathy with others. This is something an AI machine will never be able to show or do. But the question is whether this can be translated into some kind of a value in exchange, if it can be translated into a market, you know, where there is such a price pressure and where there are people who are saying, well, this is good enough. It is not good. It is not what I wanted. It's not the optimum but it's good enough for me. And that is the question, also the economic question, which I cannot answer or which I would answer on a rather negative note. And therefore, the question needs to be, how can we create a system where appreciation that is needed for human work can be preserved? And the question is, can this be done in capitalism? Well, first of all, one aspect, I almost completely agree with what you said. There's one thing I'd like to add. You mentioned an employee in a company who uses chat GPT so as to have a competitive productivity edge, but uses it secretly because this leads to a new problem, ghost AI. So content of the company is transferred outside of the company by using AI. So it would be fed into AI models. And to a large part, it would be content which the company should keep. It should stay within the company and for a good reason, only for internal purposes. And this is where it already starts. So there is like an over a straining of, in which AI warns against their own software. And this is a paper in which they use the term hallucinations and it became uh, popular. They also described the aspect of over-reliance. And that is why we as a society have to find ways and create an awareness so that people understand what they're doing because oftentimes they do not understand what they're doing and they do not know that it leads to, to lots of consequences. But I would like to sidetrack for a moment. My wife died. She had leukemia. And it took very long, way too long, until she was diagnosed. And the problem was that in the blood count and in the bone marrow aspiration results, the uh, results were always unspecific. And of course, I'm one of the people who say, if we can recognize patterns and structures in this field, And if we can do this in a way that really helps us cure people, just because we gain time, time is of the essence in these contexts, then I would be the last person who would put up resistance. I very clearly have to say that. But the question there is here is whether this one argument uh, can be used to cover everything. We can't. Michael, at the end, you talked about values, worth. And I'm talking about creating value. So containing value, creating value, and this is a big problem, and that is why your title is so awesome. Parrots, we talked about, and power, because the creation of value does not stay with us. So these LLMs, which develop a critical mass, here these companies are not based in Europe. Maybe they have a little toe in Great Britain and Great Britain, they're trying to attract them by doing away with all kinds of regulation. But other than that, they're based in the US and China. And these are different legal areas or regions. But how can we develop a counter power so that we can work against this? Or are you as pessimistic as I wouldn't call this pessimistic, I would call this factual. We simply have to have an evaluation of the consequences. The panel this morning 
talked very intensely in a very positive way about GDPR. And everyone is annoyed because they constantly have to click, do I want this? Do I agree? Do I not agree? All of this has to do with GDPR. But in the world, it has been recognized that it was trailblazing that the Europeans did this. So now we are in a fortunate situation. This month, actually this week, we are negotiating in Brussels how to kick off the AI Act, which will not address my problems, by the way. But first of all, you can consider this to be a milestone because the Europeans, again, were the first to say, we need rules. And we need to support this. We need to become part of the discussion. Of course, we always have to claim for more than we can get. But I think that in the context of democratic participation, we can create awareness and identify the shortcomings. Well, you mentioned a kind of a counterpower. I would say mm, I don't really agree. But something that may carry a potential to counter this would be the open source scene, which exists in this field. You do have to say that open source means that this would be the source code, yes. I mean, it typically means that if you have a program, you also publish the source code and that this would be uh, freely accessible and can be changed. It has something to do with licensing. You do have to say that the uh, barrier to LMM to start with this is very low. So there are tools available as open source. They're good tools. Even models are available as open source. So the individual parameters of the individual models will be published. Facebook or Meta has published their models as open source. So there is a very big scene working in this field. And you can start working with only a couple thousand euros. You can start to experiment with this and start working. So there's a very low threshold here. And something that makes me hopeful is that somehow the cards have not been shuffled yet. Or there have been shuffled, but they have not been passed out yet. And a lot can still happen. So the people that are heading this right now may not be doing so in 10 years from now. Some say open source, the scene will lose its relevance because at the end of the day, something that would be more decisive is how much computing power you have and only the big companies would have the big computing power. So I still haven't made up my mind as to what I think here. But I think that the open source scene could be something that counters the large language model trailblazers at this moment in time. And I hope that this could develop into something positive. The market is not consolidated yet, so a lot can still change. Well, but I have to add that the open source scene comes with an inborn problem. It's much more difficult to regulate. Currently, there is an incredibly important wave of child pornography just because of the quantity that has been generated. Crazy questions come up because you have no one who is the victim or has been damaged. Emma Watson's voice reading Hitler's Mein Kampf, she can't do anything against this because here they separate the voice from the actual person and the deep fake pornography and things like that, which really leads to um, specific consequences. And I know it's not a popular example, children and pornography, but right now, and I think I'm repeating what I just said before, currently, this is the status quo. The investigators, because of their AI tools, which detect child pornography, are not supposed to be able, they have no opportunity to do that because of the sheer volume that they cannot identify so-called original material anymore. Our perspectives are also part of this. Every time we carve something into stone, we create a new problem in some other area. Open source definitely will be suitable and appropriate to target the power structures and companies, and it's always the same companies we're talking about, because let's be honest, we have not learned anything. But to target that 
it is important we also have to take a look at the cost for society. I would like to come to talk about a specific example. At the beginning, we talked about the music industry. And I put out the question here, do we actually want this? Do we want to consume AI-generated products? Is this what we want to listen to? Or do we want to have the human component? Or are we not interested in that? And I found an example. Tupac and DMX uh, put together a track. Both of them are dead. But they haven't. Yeah, I know, but many people thought they did. And if you don't know both of them, you listen to the track, hear both of their voices. Okay, sure, this is Tupac, this is DMX. And then if you listen to this, and I did, and I have to say, I could not really notice any difference regarding the voices. The track wasn't really all that bad. And then you read comments, and I watched this on YouTube. People said, this is so dope, make more songs like this, please. And who cares if it's AI, it's way better than all the music played today. So if you take a look at that, then obviously there is a need to have this music. So what does this mean? What does this mean thinking of the music industry? Are they starting to panic? I don't think they're panicking. And please, let's not talk about the music industry if you mean the music economy. So the music industry would be the major companies and they actually want this because they currently are doing that because then they can enter in these partnerships. And those that are concerned would be those that cannot protect themselves or put up resistance. I studied the science of music and I focused on the psychology of music. And from this perspective, it is really important that we differentiate between reception and production. So the production level is what we're basically referring to and what fits about copyright and reception here. I don't think anyone knows how much sweat it costs me to compose a musical piece of three minutes. And we also discussed this during the system check earlier. No one knows how much effort goes into composing a three-minute song. Whether the people like it or not, we can't regulate that. This is just what it is. But if we take a look at production, we have to implement sustainability goals, so fair um, production conditions. I think this is a very interesting question. I also, of course, don't have an answer. But by now, in China, there are attempts by the platforms there to create AI-generated stars, they promote AI-generated influencers, because this is the ideal form of exploitation. Actually, it's no exploitation if you take a look at it, right? Yeah, it's difficult, difficult, difficult. It's a marketing shtick or tool. But 100% of the benefits goes to the company. And if I think back, I mean, take that and think and so on. We're popular when I was young. Yeah. And all of this was artificial, too. They were casted bands. And it was just something made up. Oh, you know, you're destroying so many dreams by saying that, you know. Well, but is it really such a difference? Is it such a big leap? I mean, casting these performers that are interchangeable and comparing it with this. No, 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 no. I don't think we agree here. Because your personal aesthetic judgment is something that you yeah but still i mean it's about the production process in this case this is what i meant i was referring to the process of production so is it structurally really all that different i don't think this is a good example if we talk about other music yeah but if we talk about remixes this is what i wanted to refer to because for example if we came up with the idea and if we were to say we try to address this based on copyright and no one is allowed to use remixes that are AI generated if they don't hold the copyright, then the reality would be that it's exclusively the major labels which would be capable of producing AI generated remixes because they are the owners of the catalog of copyrights. They have a library of many different things. And then we have the same problem we currently have with Spotify where the three major labels more or less dictate the entire streaming market. And then we would have introduced that on an AI level. So I'm very cautious, careful when it comes to copyright. Well, I see that time is really flying. There are so many topics that I still have on here. But nonetheless, as a brief concluding round, I know that it's specifically difficult in this field to look into the future. But maybe we can give it a go and just try. 
10 years, it's a, a utopia. But the near future, what are we to expect? And are you optimistic? Or are you rather more pessimistic in looking at this topic? Oops, I saw that uh, we have the red clock. So, well, okay, I'm optimistic there will be better models. I'm quite confident that that will be the case. Pessimistic, well, I am thinking of the impacts on society because currently I see a lot of structures that we actually need, which would be destroyed by AI. And that's my conclusion. I agree. I agree to what he said. I will continue the struggle because I believe that we as humans have to fight for ourselves. Something that, however, is positive here is that we are forced to think about ourselves more because otherwise we wouldn't know what we have to defend. Bias is a huge problem. This is a problem that currently is very difficult and prevalent in our society. Also problems regarding truth. I just see that there's a fundamental problem because there is a lack of media literacy and also disinformation. My impression is that maybe in the following we could agree because I'm constantly offered solutions to problems that I don't even have. And all of this has to do with the fact that I'm supposed to be so much more efficient. But for whom am I supposed to be more efficient? What I lack in my life is the time to think about this thoroughly. But if I have three years of training in AI so as to be able to send an email faster, this is absolutely feeble-minded. Whom does it help? It doesn't help me. It helps, and I'm going to say this terrible word, neoliberalism, but it doesn't help me. Okay, I think we can tick that box. So thank you very much, Matthias. Thank you very much.